Hey there, everyone. My name is Ryan Schul. Welcome to my channel. This is all about data science, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence. I talk about finance and um, topics related to finance a lot. I did a lesson about credit analytics a short time ago. I think that came out about two weeks ago. I dropped that video on YouTube. And uh, just a few days ago, I started to think about um, financial fraud detection and how we could use principles of data science to solve this type of problem or prevent um, this from <clears throat> this potential problem from becoming a real actual problem that we have to deal with, right? So I put some notes together and I'm gonna share it with you guys right now, okay? So the topic is financial fraud detection. We're going to use Python for everything. This is a Jupyter Notebook. For the most part, I use Jupyter Notebooks. I like the interface. I like how you can create dynamic charts that you can graph and plot, zoom in, zoom out, mouse over, and the bubbles pop up. It's pretty cool. So I, I tend to use these things a lot. So what is financial loss prevention? For individual losses, it um, pertains to fraudulent transactions that lead to significant financial losses for credit card holders. You see this all the time in the news. You hear about it from friends who lost money because they lost their credit card and somebody used that credit card to make a purchase that they shouldn't have made, right? So institutions can lose money because they can validate the credit card transaction, right? Uh, but this is a risk to the institution because they will have to reimburse the person. I think fully, it used to be the person could lose $25 and the merchant or the bank, either one would have to reimburse the credit card holder up to $25. Now I think you have to reimburse the full thing. So there's no risk really to an individual, at least in this country, but to an institution or a corporation or a merchant selling want any type of product or service too, you could be on hook for these things, right? So there's certainly an economic impact. The fraud can be widespread um, and it can cost victims uh, millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars per year, right? So this is no joke. This is a really serious thing that we have to be aware about and guard against, okay? So again, we're trying to protect customers. Uh, we might have to do this out of regulatory compliance. If we're a bank or some type of financial institution issuing credit, there's a minimum false claim. Business reputation can be on the risk. Customer retention can be compromised, right? If your bank is giving out a lot of credit card um, um, fraudulent or allowing a lot of fraudulent transactions, customers might say, hey, I don't want to deal with this bank anymore. I'm going to take my business somewhere else, right? So there's constantly evolving fraud techniques from fraudsters. We have to be vigilant and be aware of new um, fraud techniques as they come out, right? Um, and we try to reduce operational costs, operational risk, and prevent fraud in a real-time scenario. I'm going to show you at the end of this video how to do that using Kafka, which is a real-time streaming data tool, right? So that's a pretty cool tool. We'll get into that just a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and load some data that I have in this file. It's called creditcard.csv. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter to refresh the cell and create a simple little chart based on the data in that, um, in that file. If I go over to the file, we can take a look, uh, I think it's right over here. Go over here and over here. Okay, let me open the file, take just a second here, a uh, second or two. So here's the class that we're looking at. Uh, zero means no fraud, one means fraud. You can almost see no ones over here, but if you look closely, it's actually 492 cases of fraud. Um, we have 248, 315 cases of legitimate credit card transactions. 492 fraud. So by and large, most of these transactions are not spurious or false or fake or uh, fraudulent, right? Most are legit. Here's the data set that we're looking at. We have 248808 records total with the header over here. And we're looking at the class over here. Most of these are zero. So again, zero means nothing. Fraud means uh, fraud. Okay. I think you can figure that one out. And if we just filter over here, we can go zero, there's no fraud, one is fraud, and count these up. We should have, what did I say, 492. If I look down here, yeah, the sum is 492 on the bottom of my Excel spreadsheet. So let me close that. And that's exactly what we see here. It's 492, okay? So we're counting unique items in the data frame column called class. So there we go. So let's use a little um, machine learning here we are going to set our independent variable as X and Y as the dependent. So I've got several tutorials on that and several um, um, instruction videos, how that works. So we're going to create a classifier right here. 
So classifier error is, again, is if you want to assign a label to something or understand um, non-numeric data, this will be a classification type of problem. If you're looking at numeric data, you're typically doing a regression type of problem, right? This is classifying because we're looking at labels. Is this fraud or not label? Fraud or not fraud? It's a zero or a one. They sound like numbers, but it's actually a label, right? So uh, we can see here the precision. Recall an F1 score is great for the zeros. These are the non-fraudulent transactions. For the fraud, we only have 492 records, so it's kind of hard for them all to learn. Is this fraud or not fraud? Fraud is struggling here, struggling here, and struggling here for the labels that are have a one assigned to them. Because you only have 492 records, you don't have enough to really make a determination about whether or not this is fraud. So we're going to need some help here to rebalance these classes and get from uh, five, five, six, eight, seven records over here on the diagonal and three over here. This would be uh, positive, positive, negative, negative. This would be positive, negative, and negative, positive over here, right? So the model is struggling a little bit to make these classifications just because of the class imbalance. And by the way, I cut this down to one tenth just so the model runs faster. So um, whereas I took a random sample right over here, random sample uh, fraction 10% of the whole population, because if I ran the analysis on 2,000, sorry, 248,807 records, we'd be sitting here all day. I have a slow T14 ThinkPad. It's just not going to slice through in any useful amount of time. So I'm going to take a sample of that. I'm going to get 28,000 records instead of 248,000 and do the analysis on this subset. Okay, this would be the entire population. I'm taking a random sample. This should be fine for our purposes. And again, I don't want to sit here for 12 hours and wait for the analysis to finish. I want the analysis to be done relatively quickly. That's what I'm doing a sample. So with our sample data, we can see um, we have uh, zero, which is non-fraud, 22, 747, 37 fraud before the smote imbalancing, right? So we're doing smote imbalancing to oversample from the other undersample class, right? And get more samples and undersample from the majority class, right? So the majority class is zero. Most of the records fall into this. The minority class is one, right? So we go from 22747 and 37 to 13, 648, and 6824. So now the undersample class is about half of the majority class. Uh, down here, it's not even like 1%, just barely 1%. Now it's 50%. So now we have a more uh, realistic sampling um, distribution where we can go ahead and further our analysis. Before we did the smoke um, rebalancing or resampling from the undersampled and the oversampled class, um, it was really, the pendulum is really swinging in the, in the direction of the uh, non-fraud, right? But it's not helpful for our analysis. You can see over here, really the model's struggling. This should be close to 1.0, 1.0, 1.0. We're not even half, right? This one's half and it's still way under where we need to be. We need this to be like 0.8, 0.9, 0 0.95, right? So this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. This is um, unusable, right? That's why we have to do the smote analysis. Once we do smote, these classes are much more balanced, right? And we do the analysis the second time. We have 0.82, 1.0, so that's perfect. And 0.9, 0.9 is good. 0.82 is a little bit low, but it's as long as it's over 0.7, it's decent. We can go with it. Um, if we're getting 0.43 precision, 0.5 recall, 0.4. 4.6 F1 score, that is a no-go. We can't go forward with that. We have to do smoke after smoke, 0.82, that's okay. This is totally fine, perfect, and this is very good, 0.9, okay? So we can go ahead and create a confusion matrix. So we want normal, normal. So this would be normal transactions, non-fraud, and then fraud. And fraud, we actually have none because, again, the samples are pretty small, but model can't, can't really detect that. But... We don't have too many mistakes. Um, this was labeled as normal. It's actually fraud. This was labeled as fraud. It's actually normal. But we only have 9 plus 7. What is that? 16 total. 5,681 are correct. We have normal, normal. And fraud and fraud is zero. So I think we're fine there. So I created this um, histogram right here. Let me make this a little bit bigger. WIDTH equals 1100, comma, HIGG equals 600. Hopefully it works. I might say it's out of memory. Wow, what is that? Uh, okay, let me refresh this here. Reload site, change. Yeah, that's what, let me reload it. 
Maybe I made a mistake because I didn't load the data, trying to be efficient here, but this thing might get me in the end. I might have to reload the data. Let me see. Can I? Oh, 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 oh. I see. I mistyped it. Control enter to run. <clears throat> Just want a bigger chart. That's all I want, guys. Okay. Well, kind of worked. <laughs> okay. I guess it kind of worked. So we have zeros and ones if we zoom in here. So most of these transaction amounts are small. That's why everything is skewed to the left. So we have 200, 250. These are transactions, probably credit card, Costco. Um, you know, you're doing your daily shopping and whatever. We have zeros, uh, which is non fraud, one, which is fraud. So if I click on this, the nice thing about Motley Chart is you can turn these on and turn these off. Like I said, it's very interactive, right? So this is everything. This is with the zeros removed, just the ones showing. So we have a fraud transaction here. The total count is, God, it's hard to see that. I wish it wasn't red. Can we make that a different color? Uh, no. I have to reassign all the colors and everything. Okay, so by default, it's blue and it's red. A little bit hard to read this, but we just have a few transactions. This one, transaction amount is 100. And transaction count looks like 12, I think. Transaction count over here is like 200. And the transaction amount is small, $2.49 on average. So that's why I want to show you that. Let me zoom out here. Double click to zoom out. So the transaction amounts are pretty small. Over here, we have a box plot again for zero. This is non fraud. Transaction amount 183.79, but it goes up to $5,239. So it's quite a big deviation here. His $3,000 transaction amount, 2,700, 2,500. Here is fraud, right? So the average is about. Um, 776 and it goes up to 1000 1402 so i think this is interesting because the fraud transactions only go up to 1402 the non-fraud goes up to 5239 so my hypothesis would be if this is a fraud transaction these would go up much higher instead of 1042 if you're going to steal why would you steal big 10,000 20,000 unless the people doing these fraudulent transactions get scared and say I want it, it to look somewhat realistic, so I'm going to keep the maximum transaction to 1,402. So it can be some type of reverse psychology. If I get more smaller transactions, people won't be suspicious of me using a credit card that doesn't belong to me. That could be the case. So we could analyze that further by doing a couple different types of analysis. Um, what was that? Inference? I think it's called an inference analysis or something. It tells you why something happens or in causal inference. That's it, causal inference. So I have a video about causal inference. You could do a causal inference analysis on this. I actually did not, maybe I should have, but anyway, um, that's a moot point. We could have done a, a causal inference analysis and tried to understand why are these credit card transactions lower when they're fraudulent and why are they higher when they're not fraudulent. I would suspect two things. Either people don't want to get caught, so they're, keep the purchases more modest, or maybe this is just fake information. The credit card purchases are just made up by some computer algorithm or something like that. Um, the, all the data came from this website. If I go down here, you'll see it down here. Uh, it comes from Kaggle. If I go down here, you can download the CSV, right? And do this analysis for yourself so you can see all the nuts and bolts of how it works. Okay, I would encourage you to do that. So you go over here, click this download button on the upper right hand corner. Click that download and you can get the CSV that we're using here. So if the data set could be fake and be made up. Um, and that could be the reason. Or people are modest with your purchases because they're using a fake credit card or credit card that doesn't belong to them. Um, it's probably one of those two things we don't really know. Uh, but if we did the causal inference, that would probably tease out that, that answer to that. Okay. So now we're trying to um, again, run another machine learning algorithm. These are the independent variables. These are the dependent, right? So we're dropping a class from the independent variables and they can be anything. It can be two, three, four, it can be up to 20, it can be 200 or more, it's up to you. And this is a dependent variable. This is always one, this is one or more than one. So we're using a random forest classifier before, like before, training, uh, testing, fitting the model. And the first time we run it, we have 0 0.43, 0 0.5, 0 0.46, right? But then, we do the smoked um, analysis, right? And rerun this for, or is it train test split? Resplit the data. So the original accuracy score was 99.87. And after 
So wait, where was the second one? I'm sorry, I, I need to take a step back. Accuracy, pre print resample data, reinforce classifier, resplit the data. Oh yes, yeah. So we did use smoke. It was kind of hidden over here. We used smoke. So we went from 0.043 to 5 to 0.46 up to 1.0, 1.0, 1.0. So this is perfect, right? So we're getting perfect precision recall and F1 score on the non-fraud transactions, 111. All perfect on precision recall and F1 score on the smoke adjusted um, credit card fraudulent transactions. So let's use the model that we train, test, and split over here. Okay, um, here's the model making predictions, and here we here we fit the model. We're using the model to make predictions. Here's the Y predict, and we use that down here to go ahead and make predictions on a new transaction that comes into us, right? So remember that that um, CSV file that I showed you before, these are all the headers. These are the numerics in each column. And then the transaction amount right here, we're going to label this as fraud or no fraud. We have zero, um, of course, is no fraud and one is fraud. We know that for a fact. The transaction is not fraud, zero, zero, and the probability of it being fraud is 0 0.6 and 0 0.3. So we actually have a label of zero, not fraud, and it's preloadability low probability of being fraud code. So we could actually say that transaction is not fraud, but it could be fraud, right? But what's the probability of that? It's 0 0.06 less than 10% and 0 0.03, go three tenths of 1%. So pretty low probability, right? So we're pretty confident around this. Again, here's our accuracy, precision, F1 scores. So everything looks fine. Um, good, good, good. And we are going to use Kafka, like I promised at the beginning of the video to produce some real-time simulated credit card transactions. So Kafka is a real-time um, heavy-duty data simulator um, or data processor, right? So as credit card transactions come in from all the purchasers all over the place. I live in New York City. I'm sure there's banks all over New York City, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, um, uh, RoboBank, Santander, um, Amalgamated Bank, Take Your Pick, um, Webster Bank, all these banks, I'm sure they have Kafka running 24 seven to analyze every single transaction that comes in. When you run it, I'm giving you all the code again, you can take this, run it as is. What you have to do is hit control enter on your keypad, put your mouse in a cell, you can see the mouse is here, put it in cell, hit control enter to refresh that, and you'll have your Kafka simulated transaction. So this is a produced transaction, hypoth hypothetical, that I just created using Kafka, which is a real time data processing system. You have all your metrics down here, and it detects this as fraud or no fraud. It says this is not fraud, so zero label. Okay, and the second hypothetical scenario that I created, fraud, zero, uh, not fraud. Okay, so Kafka sends transactions in real time, receives and processes data. Super fast, guys, super fast. You have no idea how fast this thing is, um, but it's running on a server. If you run this on your laptop like I did, it actually took like several seconds to produce this. And in the real scenario, this would be running a very powerful server with a lot of clusters of RAM and big horsepower behind it. So it's processing probably hundreds of thousands of transactions, a fraction of a second. Um, you see two transactions here. So um, we simulated like pretty close to reality here, but I don't have access to that kind of server. Um, the banks have that credit card transactions. I don't have real credit card transactions, right? I just have what was given to me by this, uh, what is this thing? Um, Kaggle website over here. Okay. So that is it guys. Um, in a nutshell, that's how you do fraud analysis and protect yourself from deceptive financial transactions, right? Or fraudulent credit card swipes. That's it. Um, hopefully I dropped some useful, interesting, uh, knowledge on you today and bestowed some wisdom at the same time. So I'm going to wrap it up. I will share the video later today and share the source code with the video. If you have any questions, post it in the comments. And that's it, guys. See you in the next one. Bye.